Today, Aviation Theater is pleased to have astronaut Bill Anders as a guest on Aviation Theater. And Bill, you're a local boy. You went to school in La Mesa. Went to La Mesa Elementary, then uh, Lemon Avenue School, and then Grossmont before I went to the Naval Academy. Now, you went to the Naval Academy, but uh, you took your commission in the Air Force. Right. With all due respect to the brave naval aviators, I thought I'd take my chances in the airplane, not on the flight deck. But your family history is Navy. Right. Your father was on the Panay. Right. He was on the uh, Panay and the Yangtze River. Panay? So, yes. Mm -hmm. well, would you tell our viewers just a little bit about that? It's an interesting story. Well, he was uh, stationed on the Yangtze River Patrol in 1935, I think, in that era. And uh, uh, my mother and I uh, would follow up and down the river. I was four. You were born in China, weren't Born you? in China in 33, in Hong Kong. And uh, then uh, the uh, Sino-Japanese War started, so they moved out the dependents. In fact, we were the uh, first passenger ship down the Yangtze River after it was mined. And then uh, when we got to Shanghai, we were uh, dive-bombed. Uh, bombers came right over the hotel we were in and dropped their bombs. This is sand pebble stuff, isn't this, it? Yes, uh, a little, little, that was sand pebble and Steve McQueen was a little earlier than that. But uh, anyway, uh, my dad stayed there. He was executive officer on the Panay, and they had American flags painted all over the uh, boat. Uh, basically showing the flag, and uh, yet one day, on uh, December uh, 3rd, I believe, uh, they were steaming up the river, and some lookout reported some high-altitude bombers, and uh, the Japanese, as it turned out, had decided to uh, disgrace the Americans in order to try to break the will of the Japanese, uh, the Chinese, because the Japanese army was basically out of control over in China. And anyway, the uh, first bomb uh, uh, knocked out the captain, so my dad uh, had to take over, and then the subsequent uh, bombings and dive bombers showed up. Why, uh, he received shrapnel wounds on two occasions, once in his hands and then in his throat, so that he couldn't uh, uh, say the orders verbally, but uh, he uh, actually used a pencil, and in some cases he'd use blood to write on the, uh, on the chart. He wrote the orders? In, in his yeah, own blood. And, and basically, uh, basically, we think was the first American naval officer to order open fire on the Japanese. And um, uh, unfortunately, though, the ship was thoroughly holed, and they had to abandon ship, and they were chased around uh, by the Japanese Army and Air Force. Uh, well, it was another and, sneak attack. Yes, yeah, right. We were at peace. Right. And of course, they said so sorry, but uh, but uh, that was a harbinger of things to come, obviously. And then you came back to the States and went to school, you said Lemon Avenue? Yes, he was, uh, he had been badly wounded, as it turned out, and got uh, staph infections in his hands. And in those days, he didn't have any drugs, either sulfur. Uh, so he was in the Naval Hospital uh, for some time and eventually was retired uh, on a medical just before the war. Then the war started, we were living here, and he was called back in and uh, served out through the war in San Diego and uh, for a little while in, up in uh, Washington State. So then you went through uh, Lemon Avenue Elementary School. Well, I went through La Mesa Elementary. La Mesa Elementary. And then uh, Lemon Avenue. And Junior then, High. Uh, no, that was sort of the intermediate school. And then uh, went, to four, uh, went to Grossmont. But uh, just before I graduated from Grossmont, uh, they sent me down to a school called the Boyden School, which was oh, right, private school. right on. Well, it was a kind of a mm -hmm. teach not so sharp kids how to pass a Naval Academy entrance exam, which I did, and then uh, went to the Naval Academy. That that isn't true. <laughs> Boyden is a very high standard school. Yeah, yeah. So you went to the Naval. I think Academy. it's now a freeway, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I remember the Boyden yeah. school. It was the main uh, thing I remember. But it was right under the approach path, the Lindbergh and the B-36s would come over and it would just disrupt the whole school day to have one of those aluminum overcasts come by. So you went to the Naval Academy at yes, Annapolis, right. graduated, and uh, decided to take your commission in the Air Force. Right. Now, I met you in 1963 at the Scout Hut in La Mesa. That's right. Uh, tell us what happened between uh, Annapolis and that time. You had just been selected to be an astronaut at that time. Well, at, at that time, I was living in Albuquerque as an engineer, Air Force engineer and uh, instructor pilot, and applied uh, for the astronaut program. And to my amazement, kept surviving all the cuts, and uh, eventually was selected in uh, 
the third group, what they called the Apollo group, and uh, reported to uh, the Johnson Space Center, which hadn't even been built in those days, in late 63, and uh, basically went into training, was assigned uh, as a, uh, initially as a backup crew for Gemini, and I was going to, uh, to be teamed with, I was teamed with Neil Armstrong, and uh, we were going to fly on Gemini 13, but they canceled it. So then we went into Apollo, and Neil and I uh, were the first two to check out a thing called the Lunar Landing Training Vehicle, so I thought uh, that, uh, and Neil thought too, that we were right up there to be uh, Lunar Landing Crew early on, and he was right and I was wrong because... Uh, well, they, the very next mission after yours landed on the moon. No, they, they, they had two between those. Oh, were they? Yes. But what happened was the uh, Apollo 1 fire uh, threw the whole program oh, into right. disarray. That's right. So then they reshuffled the people, and I was reshuffled to a lunar landing crewman with Frank Borman and Mike Collins, and we were going to initially do a uh, lunar module test around the Earth, and then we would probably have a chance to be, uh, if not the first, at least early lunar landers. It didn't turn out that way. Well, it didn't turn out that way because the lunar module fell behind schedule. The Russians were rumored to be going to try a circumlunar flight, just one, one big orbit, uh -huh. which would have been a pretty big PR uh, coup. So uh, senior NASA, NASA management, in a real demonstration of guts and, I thought, foresight, mainly a guy by the name of George Lowe, who's since deceased, uh, decided that Apollo 8 would leave its lunar module behind and in the last few months was turned from an Earth orbital flight to a lunar orbit flight. And that was a big and risky step. I remember at the time, I was surprised yeah. uh, that, that we were doing that. I, I thought it was going to be... Uh, in little baby steps. Well, that's what the original plan was, but uh, this worked out okay. The base, Jim Lovell came onto the crew sort of at the last minute because our other crewman, Mike Collins, who did fly on Apollo 11, developed a uh, temporary neck problem. But uh, I've always regretted not being a lunar landing guy and getting sort of stuck off into the command module track. But, but you nonetheless, were the first to orbit the moon. Nonetheless, you know, being the first to leave the Earth's uh, uh, but gravity where we all evolved and uh, be the first to go out into space around the moon was uh, you know, a pretty nice thing. what was the name of your mission again? Apollo 8. Apollo 8. Right. So you, you took off and uh, you left the Earth's gravity. Right. And you went to the moon. Mm -hmm. And at that time we had never seen the far side of the moon. That's, that's right. Never had seen it with human eyes. The Russian, there had been a Russian lunar orbiter that had gotten some crude pictures of the back of the moon but nothing very good. So we went into lunar orbit, and uh, mainly to test the whole navigation tracking gear. The command module had been tested in Earth orbit, but it had not been tested uh, with the massive uh, speeds of reentry. The Earth orbital reentry speed is 17,000 feet a second, and the, uh, or excuse me, 23,000 feet a second, and the uh, lunar return speed is 35,000 feet a second. So that's a major increase. So. Uh, we not only got the first uh, high-speed reentry, which set the world speed record, uh, but uh, we also were the first to fly on the Saturn V, this giant uh, booster, and get to see viewers, the uh, back uh, of the moon. When you went to the moon, you went around the backside. Right. Would you tell our viewers a little bit about that? You were the first humans to go around the backside and see the other side of the moon. Well, we. Uh, I sort of expected us to see the moon sort of in a Jules Verne way, watching it out like the front of your airplane as you approach, having it getting bigger and bigger. But as it turned out, it was a very new moon, which meant that the sun was almost behind the moon from the viewed from the Earth. So if we were to look at the moon, we had a problem maybe of getting uh, uh, blinded. And so NASA dictated that we would not look there, and they turned our spacecraft, perp uh, the axis perpendicular, to the Earth's sun line, and we went into a barbecue mode, and we basically did not see the moon until just before we went behind it. And I remember, uh, when, and on the way, by the way, we couldn't see stars because there was uh, fog and uh, urine crystals and whatnot around the spacecraft, so the uh, space was a... So it really isn't a vacuum. There, there well, it's a vacuum, but we produced a little stuff up there that, uh -huh. uh, by the way, was what uh, Scott Cochran thought was fireflies, but he was flying in his own stuff. In any event, uh, you couldn't see 
stars, uh, and Rod was kind of a flat black. And then when we went, we were now going backwards, ready for our slowing down maneuver so that the weak lunar gravity could capture us. Otherwise, we'd just speed right around and come back to Earth. Uh, we're going backwards, and we went into the shadow of the moon uh, from the sun and the double shadow from Earthshine. And it was so dark, and suddenly the stars were everywhere, so many that you couldn't recognize even the common constellations without really studying it, because all these low... Because you see so many stars that you You saw so seen many before. seen before, right. right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I remember looking around, and the first time, in a sense, I saw the moon, I just saw this big no-star circle, big black hole. And I must say, that's the only time... That has to be the moon. That has to be the moon. It was the only time the hair sort of stood up on the back of my neck. I thought, now, this really is serious. But uh, anyway, we went behind the moon, out of radio contact, and at the uh, precise, we were counting down to the retrograde maneuver, almost directly behind, at the back side of the moon from the Earth, when it looked like, I thought, someone was pouring oil down the, um, the, the window of the spacecraft. We'd had a problem with uh, outgassing of sealant, so the windows were kind of messed up. And here it looked like oil running down there. And then I refocused my eyes and realized it was the very early lunar sunset on that particular part of the moon, and very long shadows. And the movement was really us going over the moon. That was the first. But it looked like oil? It looked like oil, up, and I, but I just didn't realize I wasn't focused on the window. And then suddenly I said, hey, look at that. And uh, we all were very impressed, and, except it was getting like 20, 19, 18, so we had to quit looking for a while and concentrate on uh, making the rocket uh, maneuver just so right. So you came out from the back side of the moon? Well, we slowed down. And uh, everything worked right on uh, schedule. We were upside down, so we came back around and uh, were able to see that uh, the lunar surface, it was much rougher than the front surface. It is much rougher. And I guess the ge geologist or lunologist, or whatever they call themselves, are still trying to figure out exactly why that's the that, case. That's the immediate question. Yeah. Why, yeah. And uh, there's all kinds of theories, but I uh, won't go into that. But nonetheless, it's much rougher, mostly what they call terra, as opposed to mare, the ocean-looking stuff from the Earth. So uh, we went around a couple of times and re-maneuvered to bring us. We, went, we were in a 60 by 120 mile orbit, and we made another maneuver and uh, brought the uh, apogee down, the high point down, and then rolled over on our, you know, with our heads away from the moon. And that was when we came around and for the first time saw the, uh, this beautiful Earth rise over the lunar surface. Uh, it's a very famous photograph of yeah. the Earth rising. I wish I had a mill surface. for every time that's been reproduced. Yes. <laughs> How many times did you orbit? Uh, we were in lunar orbit 10 times and then uh, once sort of for the big one. So I counted as 11. 11 orbits around the moon. And that was uh, Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, right, yes. 1968? 68, right. Then uh, you were ready to come back. Tell us about the return trip. Uh, the return trip, well, um, the, uh, after spending the uh, time in the moon, we, uh, we uh, went behind, reignited uh, the engine, this time uh, pointing forward, or we were pointing forward, gave the velocity back that we'd taken away, now the moon couldn't hold us, so we were sort of flung out like a, uh, one of those bolos uh, and back into Earth orbit. And it always amazed me that uh, we were able to make that maneuver so precisely that we didn't have to make a correction all the way back. I want to ask you about that in just a minute. Okay. For now, we're going to break for a very important message. We'll be right back. Aviation Theater salutes. Navy Captain Edwin D. McKellar. Ed is the executive director of the San Diego Aerospace Museum and is responsible for many of the acquisitions and much of the growth that the museum has enjoyed during the last decade. He was a member of the Navy's famous Blue Angels aerobatic team in the 1950s and later flew over 300 combat missions in Vietnam. We're back with astronaut Bill Anders, and we're ready now to hear about that return trip. 
Well, uh, we, as I said, reignited the engines uh, behind the moon, gave ourselves the additional velocity required to break away from the relatively weak lunar gravity. That takes much less of, of a blast to, to get what, away from what, the moon. Whatever you take out to get into lunar orbit, you've got to put back to get out of lunar orbit. It's uh, very balanced. Uh, so we put that energy back, burned the uh, service propulsion system for several minutes, as I recollect, popped out from behind the moon, much to the uh, relief of the people on the ground, because that was a, kind of a hairy maneuver, and then uh, shot a lot of pictures and then settled down for the long fall back down to Earth. And I must say, it even got a little boring. We, uh, we, we, actually, it's free fall. You're actually you're falling. falling all the way. So you fall inside the spacecraft, and uh, therefore, you feel like there's no gravity. Actually, there is gravity. It's working on both of you. But, uh, you know, you can get zero gravity training by going down to a tall building and jumping out. Uh, and it'll be pretty realistic until you hit the ground. I remember seeing uh, training in an airplane. They would take mm -hmm. you up and then go into a shallow dive. Right. You would experience zero gravity. They called it the vomit comet. I remember <laughs> seeing you uh, live on TV when, when you were in space. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you were demonstrating that um, everything you eat and drink is in a plastic bag, and you mm -hmm. have to drink with straws. And I guess it was a Jim Lovell was the commander. Uh, no, he was the navigator. The navigator. Yeah. Uh, I believe it was Jim. Was, Frank was, Borman was the commander. Maybe it was Frank. Someone was narrating, and mm -hmm. uh, you you were fixing up some tang, and you had put some tang and some water in a plastic bag, and mm -hmm. they squeezed it around. They, they squeezed it around. And they said, and uh, then we set it up on the shelf and let it set for about 15 minutes to settle. Whereupon you promptly pulled a straw out and started to <laughs> drink it. And he says, well, I guess he's thirsty. Well, the, uh, the juice is mixed up almost immediately. But we did have to let the food lay around to re it's dehydrated. And so it had to uh, hydrate, and that took a while. But uh, it, in a microwave, when you cook something, they say let it set in there another two minutes or so yeah. to, to set or whatever it does. Well, we had a little gun that you uh, shot uh, water into this plastic bag with a, through a valve and you gave it a certain number of squirts, half ounces as I recollect, and then you mushed it around and it had a built-in straw. But then it also had a built-in uh, biocide pill down at the bottom so when you a were done... biocide pill? Yeah, you, uh, you uh, took this pill after you ate and broke it out of the the bottom, I don't quite remember how, and you stuck it back where the food was and mashed it around, and what it did was kill any bacteria so you wouldn't get a lot of gas from the garbage. I see. There would be methane that come up off of the garbage? I guess. Uh -huh. Yeah. So uh, that counteracted that? Killed the bugs. Okay. You, you came back into Earth's orbit. Tell us about your splash down and landing. Well, technically, we never we never went into Earth orbit. What you we came did... came straight down? We, uh, we came in at an angle. A uh, very narrow window, as I recollect, about uh, 10 miles high and uh, maybe 50 miles wide, which is sort of like a, a letter slot up in Los Angeles if we were on the moon right now. And we had to hit that slot at just the right angle. If we went in too shallow or too high above it, we would bounce out and we'd be in deep trouble because we like skimming a rock on the water skimming a rock on the water we didn't have that we would have jettisoned our service module which contained all the useful stuff so we'd be out there and we'd be in big trouble or if you hit it too steeply you'd uh, dig in and burn up the heat shield uh, could only stand so much but so there's um, no room for error no very little room for error uh, you can tweak it on the way back by maneuvering the engines to change your velocity vector a little bit but since, you know, you never don't want to turn the engine on unless you have to, you couldn't, who knows, it might blow up. So we were, as I recollect, uh, the guidance provided by the Earth, we didn't do any onboard navigation, actually, provided from the Earth's tracking system, uh, ascertained that we were right on track. We'd never made a maneuver to speak of and hit right through the middle of the mail slot. And, Wonderful uh, navigation. And uh, we came in uh, at night, first night entry. And uh, that was pretty spectacular. The whole sky lit up, and big chunks seemed like they were coming off the spacecraft, but they were just little grains of uh, heat shield. But they all ionized because we were, I think, 7,000 degrees centigrade, terrifically hot. 
Well, something the size of an aspirin tablet can be seen for 100 miles oh, yeah. when you're in space. Yeah, and it, you know, coming in just like a little meteorite, they make a big flash. And so we were basically a meteorite that kept going. So after you made that flight, you continued uh, as an astronaut for a while, and then uh, you went to work in NASA. Well, uh, I immediately turned around and was back up uh, command module pilot for the Apollo 11 lunar landing flight. I was always hoping someone would step on a banana peel and I'd get to go, but they didn't do it. And then, uh, as that was ending up, I was assigned, though not announced, as a prime crew member for Apollo 13. Uh, my backup was a fellow named Ken Mattingly, and if you've seen the movie, uh, by the time they started the movie history, uh, well, he was on the prime crew, but I was asked to come to Washington and work in a thing called the Aeronautics and Space Council, which was a presidential appointment position to help structure the future space program after Apollo. So I was left the Apollo 13 crew, figured I'd already done that, and uh, went to Washington uh, working in this space policy thing. We got the space policy set, uh, shut that down, went to the Atomic Energy Commission, because I'm a graduate nuclear engineer, I guess, and then the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and uh, then as ambassador to Norway, and then I started working for a living. I didn't know you were ambassador to Norway. Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, my daughter is recently married a Norwegian, so uh, we're thick in Norway. Great place. And then, uh, uh, w was the uh, General Dynamics located here in San Diego? Well, I went to, uh, was initially went to work for General Electric, and uh, spent uh, some really good years managing their uh, nuclear energy products division, and then the aircraft equipment division, and uh, then company by the name of Textron made me an offer I couldn't refuse, so I left and went with them, and I was about to uh, move on, and uh, General Dynamics chairman af offered uh, the vice chair and then his um, be a successor for General Dynamics, and uh, unfortunately, I uh, accepted the job in September of 1989 to show up on 1st of January of 1990, and I say unfortunately in quotes because the Cold War the, the Berlin Wall came tumbling down, the Cold War was over, the bottom fell out of the marketplace, and so here I'd been uh, going to this dream job of the leading defense contractor, and suddenly the market was gone. I mean, from a, you know, humankind point of view, it was a very good thing. Uh, Career-wise, it was a disappointment. Mm -hmm. And I stayed with General, General Dynamics in St. Louis. I want to say that um, we're very fortunate to have people like Bill Anders honest to goodness, decent American heroes. At a time when men wear earrings in their eyelids and dye their hair purple, uh, yeah, is, uh, people like this. Not purple, <laughs> <laughs> a little gray. <laughs> people like this deserve our respect. Thank and, you. Uh, I admire and respect Bill Anders. Uh, I, I met you again. Uh, we got our silver beavers together That's in the right. Boy Scouts. That's right. Here in San Diego. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but when you went to the moon, you carried a name tag with you that my son had made yep. uh, when he was in the Cub Scouts. Right, it's a big arrowhead, as I recollect. Uh, and um, I believe you, you donated an airplane uh, to the Young Eagles. I know right. you're very active in up, youth. Up in uh, Washington State. You donated an airplane yeah. to the Young Eagles yeah, in Washington 150, State. 150. A Cessna and, 150. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. And I, I wish I'd have been in San Diego when you were running the uh, Air Scouts, because I would have joined that. When I was here, it was just an Explorer Scout post. I think there was one in San Diego and one in Santee, so I got uh, went to the Santee one. I but, started the uh, Aviation Explorer Scouts in San Diego in 1969. Uh, we soloed 200. Uh, we taught them to fly first in gliders at Otai Lake, and then we moved them over to Brownfield and taught them to fly in a Mooney Cadet. Now, I fly an air coop, and the Mooney Cadet is what eventually became of the mm -hmm. air coop. Mm -hmm. But it had changed so much that uh, when I was flying that Mooney Cadet, I didn't recognize that it was, was <laughs> right. what was once an air coop. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to tell our audience today? Well, it's, uh, it's really been great talking to you. Uh, San Diego is a great place. I always felt real bad that uh, the Cold War came along and we had to really downsize uh, a lot of the San Diego uh, facilities. But um, you can, they can talk to, to uh, Gorbachev about that. But in the meantime, I'm, 
flying P-51 Mustang and a Waco Super, so... Uh, Life is tough. Right. <laughs> this is his uh, P-51 Mustang behind us here. Absolutely museum quality mint airplane. And he drove up in a, a Ford convertible. Is it 34? 34. 34 Ford right. convertible. Well, it's just one year younger than I am. I'm trying to make the point that oldies are still goodies. <laughs> well, I've got a Model A Ford, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell you what year that is. Thank you so much for well, being with us Cam today. Fred, on thank you. And keep up the good work. Really a pleasure being with you. God bless America. Right.